collective insights as a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. Collective Insights and the work we do at Neurohacker Collective is made possible from the support of our community and the sales of our product, Qualia. Qualia is a comprehensive mental enhancement supplement designed to improve focus, mood, and flow state. Learn more about Qualia at neurohacker.com and use coupon code COLLECTIVEINSIGHTS20 for $20 off your first order. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Neurohacker Collective podcast, Collective Insights. My name is Daniel Schmachtenberger. I'm with Research and Development here at the Collective, and we have Dr. Heather Sanderson with us today. Delighted to have Heather here. Heather is a naturopath and the medical director of North County Natural Medicine here in uh, San Diego, Encinitas area, where uh, Neurohackers headquarters are located. <clears throat> we... Uh, we actually recorded a podcast with Heather and released it uh, a little while ago, and it says part one. And it says part one really because the podcast just cut off um, technically afterwards, so we lost this really lovely two-hour conversation into a uh, a complex systems model of medicine and how to do complex medicine that uh, Heather and I have worked on over the course of years together. And um so we'll redo that one at some point, <clears throat> but based on the little <laughs> portion of it that we called part one that was released and the questions that came in, uh, most of the questions were actually related to uh, closer to the actual field of Neurohacker Collective, which was kind of neuropsych and understanding mood and cognition and brain and mind. So we're just going to go ahead and dive into this time rather than um, talking about the future of medicine writ large, we're going to talk about the future of integrative mind-brain wellness, integrative psychiatry, psychopharmacology, et cetera. Um, I want to do our disclaimer up front, which is this podcast is for education entertainment only. This Nothing here should be considered medical advice, even though we're talking about medicine. And uh, even though doctors hear this, you're not hearing anything that is in the context of you being a patient and getting direct feedback and et cetera. So definitely go talk to a qualified healthcare professional about anything that's going on for you. Um, <clears throat> and also as we talk about the term future of psychiatry, where we're talking about how to affect physiology, brain chemistry in ways that affect um, mind, emotion, psyche. Heather is coming to this work as a naturopath, not a psychiatrist. She works with a MD psychiatrist in her practice and psychologists and many other specialists. Her practice is really focused on doing the things that are not currently done in uh, most of psychiatry or psychology, which is looking at deeper underlying biochemical dynamics that can lead to nervous systems functioning suboptimally. Um, and that ends up also giving insights about how to make them function more optimally for things like sleep, pain, anxiety, depression, brain fog, all kinds of interesting things. So that's what we are going to dive into today. And uh, it is a delight for me personally to have Heather here on the show because um, she has indulged me <clears throat> uh, things that I wanted to do from research with uh, people finding a way to in the medical clinic actually practice some of the wacky stuff. Um, and so we've, we've been able to uh, develop things in the space together. So Heather, thank you for being with us today. Daniel, thank you so much for having me. It really is such a treat to get to talk to you and about medicine in particular. It's always fun. So I think that the universe was on our side when we had to record a second time, because it means that we just get to dive deeper and have an even um, bigger conversation about it and how we can help your listeners and, and anyone out there who's interested in optimizing their, the function of their brain. Okay, so let's talk about um, if you wanted to just kind of do an initial sense of what does an integrative approach to psychiatry, to mind-brain wellness look like. So if we're looking at emotional issues or cognitive issues, um, how do you see that tier one? 
Yeah. So when I see a patient, so a great example is a patient I saw recently who had some cognitive decline. Um, she was struggling with dementia and by cognitive decline, I mean significant. So she was having trouble even carrying on a conversation. I'd ask her a question like, do you have bowel movements every day? Or what did you have for dinner last night? And she would start to answer. And then even before she could express herself before she could answer my question, she would forget what the question was. So I don't know if you've ever been in a conversation with someone like that where they say, they start to answer and then say, wait, what was your question? And um, it was really heartbreaking. She couldn't remember her husband's name, her friend's names. And we said, okay, where do we start? I think her husband was very overwhelmed. The patient was clearly frustrated and um, it, it was would be overwhelming for anyone. Where do you start? Is there a magic pill? A lot of people are hoping that there's just one thing they can do to get better. And really, I don't think that that's that's not an option right now. And so what we have is the model that you and I have discussed over the years and, and that Dr. Bredesen in this case has presented the end of Alzheimer's. How do we look at all of the factors that could potentially contribute to a patient's cognitive decline and then systematically go through them? I typically start with toxins. And the reason I start with looking at toxins is for, well, there's a number of reasons, but one is because they are tier one. They are causal. So, and number two is they're mostly a ignored by the conventional medical community. So there's a lot of people who come in who have never had their toxic burden addressed. This patient in particular, she did not have bowel movements every day. She had bowel movements about once a week. And that's a really foundational place to start because she wasn't eliminating toxins. So even the normal day-to-day toxins that every cell produces, the hormones that we need to get rid of, any sort of metabolic waste we need to get rid of, that was piling up and up and up in her. In addition, she had a mouthful of amalgam. So we know that there was some heavy metal exposure over the years. She was 74 years old, so she had accumulated, she'd had decades to accumulate things. And then on top of that, she lived in a moldy home. So that was a very, those were very clear places to start for me. For another person, you know, they might be experiencing cognitive decline or anxiety or depression or insomnia, and maybe they've had a recent hysterectomy. So they no longer have ovaries that are producing the hormones that we need to maintain balance there. A thorough intake, and that's why I ask my patients to give me a full 90 minutes for intake and fill out the paperwork in advance is because there is so much complexity to this. And there's also a lot of simplicity and and that paradox of both, right? If I can get enough information, then sometimes it is very straightforward, but we have to get that information first and determining the first step in terms of testing or even some some therapeutic intervention really depends on the story, on what the exposures have been and um, and maybe what the thing, what healthy things have been taken away, like in the case of someone with a hysterectomy, healthy hormone levels. Okay, so when we think about what things affect someone's emotions or affect their thinking. Uh, We say, okay, well, emotions and thinking are mediated in the nervous system via certain neural networks and certain neural chemistry. So we start thinking about brains and nervous systems, and we realize that brains and nervous systems live inside of a body, which lives inside of an environment. Uh, Then whether there's mold in the environment, whether there's environmental toxins in the environment, what's going on in the physiology, anywhere from a genetic level to hormones, to deficiencies of nutrients, to toxicity, Mm -hmm. to movement patterns, to chronic pain that could lead to inflammation. All of these might be part of the picture. Mm -hmm. So since you mentioned toxins as one of the kind of early things to look at, um, there are going to be some people who are comfortable with that topic, some who haven't heard of it, and some who are quite skeptical um, because the word toxins in the kind of uh, science-based, the thing that calls itself science-based medicine or evidence-based medicine um, uh, oftentimes thinks about toxins and particularly the way that um, certain people in the alternative health that are not necessarily doing the most science-backed version of alternative health Mm -hmm. talk about it, which is we need to do a cleanse to get rid of toxins. It basically is a voodoo term. Um, Let's talk about when we say toxins, what do we mean? And how do we know that it's actually happening? Yeah. And what is the difference between toxins as you're talking about them and the kind of acute exposure um, that a toxicologist might look at? Yeah. So the way things about toxins is they come in three flavors. So we have heavy metal toxins. We have 
biotoxins, which most of the time we're talking about mold toxins or mycotoxins, but there are others that are out there. And then third, we have our chemical toxins. So things like petrochemicals, styrenes, benzenes, plastics, um, other environmental toxins that you might, things that might be in the water or um, might be in makeup, might be in other chemicals that we're using. So when I break those down, you can certainly have um, some dose-dependent toxins where if you get an, a very high amount, you know, that can obviously lead to death. Like if you had heavy metal poisoning that led to death, then it, that's possible. Um, that's why we worry about lead paint. Um, that's why we took the lead out of fuels. That's why, you know, they've gone away from mercury in the amalgams and in, in thermometers. And, and uh, we know that mercury exposure can kill you. So, when you have a very high amount, there, death is possible. When you have low amounts, it is also possible that there is degradation of the system so that toxins are influencing the system. Typically, they are fat soluble. And so you'll have multi-systemic symptoms come up that are probably vague at first. And if the toxin continues to come into the system, then it can build up and up and up, especially if genetically, you mentioned genetics a little bit ago, especially if genetically you don't get rid of them as well as your neighbor or your friend or even a family member. So those toxins as they build up can start to accumulate and can create more and more detrimental symptoms. So people will experience effects in their immune system. They might get sick more frequently. They might have autoimmune conditions showing up. Even things like cancers can show up if there are, is a high toxic burden. Um, so the immune system can be affected, the brain and the nervous system. Um, so numbness and tingling, twitching and, and muscle spasms, all of these sorts of things can come up and certainly cognitive decline um, with just because of the fact that most heavy metals are going or heavy metals are going to be fat soluble and bind to fat soluble tissues. Also our glands, our glands are very fat soluble. So things like thyroid and other hormones can be affected um, when metals bind there. Um, when we switch to talking about biotoxins, a lot of people are familiar with Botox, right? Botox is, uh, it, it paralyzes your muscles. That's why we use it to prevent wrinkles in the forehead. We can inject botulinum toxin. So biotoxins are the toxins produced by a living organism. And we can measure these. We can also measure heavy metals. So we can measure these toxins and how much you are releasing. Typically we're measuring mycotoxins because water damaged buildings um, will have mold present and that mold will then produce a toxic um, substance that we can inhale, that we can be exposed to, and then that can accumulate just like a heavy metal. People get a little confused. It's not the mold that's causing the problem all the time, although that can, and that's sort of a separate issue. It's the mycotoxin, the toxin produced by the mold that can be this fat-soluble toxin accumulating in your body and wreaking havoc, causing fatigue and headaches and nervous system problems, hormonal problems all of these things. Um, and that's also the other thing that makes it confusing is that patients have so many symptoms. They go to neurology, they go to dermatology, they go to endocrinology, they go to all the specialists because of their symptoms. And it's hard to get somebody to put all the pieces back together and say, oh, there might be one root cause. And that could be a, a mycotoxin exposure. So we can measure that in urine. Um, and that's relatively inexpensive to do these days. For a long time, it was about seven, $800 to do. And now it's about two, $300. Um, so that makes it a little bit more accessible for people to find out. And then the third one, um, the third flavor, as I like to think of them, of toxin is the, the benzenes and styrenes that I was referring to. And again, we can test those in the urine. And so you can get a measurable amount. And there are some degrees of normal in there, um, particularly for environmental regions. So like in Southern California, you tend to see more of these toxins showing up that are associated with petrochemicals, with fuels, I think because uh, most of us live in close proximity to I-5. And so if you talk to Great Plains or any of the labs that run these tests, they'll say, oh yeah, environmentally, we'll see things that are elevated around military bases like perchlorate um, often ends up in the water there. And in California, in the state of California, actually the herbicides and pesticides were quite high during the drought that we experienced for a number of years. And then when the drought went away, um, across the board, you saw that level of herbicides and pesticides go down in, in everyone tested in California. And they thought that that was because of the drought, there was a higher concentration in the water table. And so you were seeing that in the entire population of California, which is pretty unreal. Um, but we all needed a little extra glutathione during those years. So, 
<laughs> extra glutathione to deal with extra glyphosate. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So uh, two kind of important topics I'll just you know, reiterate that I heard in there. So there's a difference between uh, acute clinical toxicity. Someone is actually doing agricultural work and they spray the glyphosate in their face um, and they actually have to go do active medical detox work because whether they're going to die or they're just in acute symptomology, they're in very clear acute symptomology. And that could be to any of the kinds of toxins, right? This usually happens in an industrial setting or something like Flint, Michigan, or some right. place where the toxicity load is very high, very fast. <clears throat> um, but that there's exposure to things that are actually damaging to biology, so we call them toxins, that are not at a high enough level to create really obvious acute symptomology, but they're still having an effect on the physiology and that effect can uh, cascade over time and can also accumulate over time. Precisely. And so we're looking at subclinical, subacute, but clinically relevant toxicity. And that's across all these categories. So that's one kind of Im important thing. The other one is that this is not an issue that has been the same forever. This is a modern, Certainly. And increasingly modern issue because right. when you're talking about organic toxins, meaning hydrocarbon-based toxins, whether we're talking about benzenes and styrenes or PCBs or phthalates that didn't exist pre-industrial mm -hmm. revolution. And in fact, you know, every year we're inventing so many more of those kinds of chemicals. And as we pr produce the pharmaceuticals, these toxins develop, or, well, the <clears throat> bacteria, the antifungals that we put in the paints, that causes all of these microorganisms to mutate in a way that they create even stronger toxins, basically, as they become more resistant to the pharmaceuticals or the antifungals that are in paints or whatever we're doing to sort of mitigate these issues, those organisms respond. They create their, they fight back and um, it's hard to keep up because they are replicating so quickly and they are genetically adapting so quickly. Uh, and as humans, we have longer, much longer lifespans. We can't keep up quite as quickly. So we have to be good about making sure our among theories or our organs of elimination are open and able to deal with that as best as they possibly can. So, if you didn't catch the reference, uh, something that I said was super important is the idea that um, toxins from uh, herbicides, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, um, industrial manufacturing effluents are new. We can all kind of get that. That makes sense. But mold, it's like, well, it seems like we have been dealing with mold for longer than humans have been around by a lot, right? It's one of the oldest types of organisms. Why would we have not evolved in some kind of harmony with it? And the kind of primary hypothesis in the space is that most molds, not all of them, but most molds in our evolutionary environment were not that problematic to us. And that they started getting problematic. We started seeing rise in biotoxin issues not that long ago. In the 70s, in the West in particular, <clears throat> US, we started putting fungicides in paints to keep fungus, to keep mold from growing inside. But it didn't mean that mold wasn't going to grow. It just meant the mold had to mutate just like MRSA is mutated to uh, be able to still live in the presence of antibiotics, but that mutated form now is something that we have no evolutionary history with, and its byproducts are something that we didn't co-evolve with. Exactly, and the buildings also are more likely to harbor mold these <clears throat> days, right? We use a lot of drywall, and as one little pipe gets missed in the plumbing, or a lot of a lot of times people will have sprinklers up next to their house and then now it's getting wet every day on the edge of the house and eventually that turns into mold on the inside or mycotoxins um, that are developing inside the wall that can actually end up, you know, in the areas that you're living in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and filters, HVAC systems, we've created homes where they, their environments for these organisms to thrive. When, and, uh, trying to get more energy efficient, making homes very sealed, mm -hmm. obviously increases uh, those dynamics. And Yeah, one of the best things you can do to reduce toxic burden is to open up the windows and doors and get that fresh air flowing from inside out. One of the most toxic places you can be is inside a building. So get outside, open the doors. And, you know, if you open the doors, you normally think, well, aren't I looking at... Uh, air pollution from cars and from coal factories in the air outside worse. 
We wish that was the case. Um, and if you live right next to a freeway, it might be the case. But the paint inside, even independent of the fungicide, just has these things called BOC, volatile mm -hmm. organic compounds. So does the carpet, so does your couch, probably. Furniture. So does the fire yeah. retardant on your bed. Um, and so when it comes to living in the presence of environmental toxin, how does it, how does one start to assess that and mitigate it? Yeah, great question. So... <clears throat> I, I'm a doctor that talks a lot about bowel movements because I think they are so, so, so important, right? So elimination. So oh, I mentioned the amunctories, and that's my fancy word for organs of elimination. So it's your bowels, liver, kidneys, lungs, and skin and lymph. And so opening up each of those pathways for elimination is so, so, so important. And we can get really profound results with complex cases. Complex medical cases can get better. Like the woman, Linda, I was telling you about at the beginning of the recording, she was so much better in just four weeks, all because she started having regular bowel movements, because she got a little bit more exercise. She was sweating every day. And all of these things can, um, can, can really facilitate getting those toxins out of the system. And the way I think about it, it's kind of like we've got the tap on and the sink plugged. And the number one thing, 75% of all environmental medicine is turning the tap off, figuring out what the exposure is. And that's why the tests come in so handy. So if we think that there's a toxic exposure based on the conversation we have, based on your exposures, then we'll test and we'll look, figure it out. There have been times when I can't figure out what's going on and we have to do a lot of testing and, and, fig and pinpoint something. And then the testing points us to the exposure versus the exposure pointing us to the testing. So sometimes we have to go back and forth with that a little bit. Um, and it can be a little a mystery to solve, but we need to figure out what that exposure is and turn the faucet off, stop the exposure. If the faucet's on and the sink is plugged, it's overflowing into symptoms. That's just bound to happen at some point. So then after we have the faucet off, and even sometimes before, we need to unplug that drain. So bowel movements every day. Liver support. So phase one, phase two liver support, glutathione, and some of the other antioxidants are fantastic. We can also measure those. We can measure nutrients. And this is how nutrients come into the conversation around toxins and toxic burden. If you don't have enough nutrients, then the liver is so amazing. I mean, the whole body is incredible, but the liver is so cool because it will actually slow down the detail processes if you don't have the nutrients to keep up because some of those secondary metabolites um, with uh, alcohol is a great one to to illustrate this example when you drink alcohol it goes to your liver and it's turned into acetaldehyde and acetaldehyde is actually more toxic to you than alcohol is lots and lots and lots of toxins are that way where the secondary metabolite the second thing that the liver makes with the toxin you ingest is actually more toxic so in all of its inherent wisdom which i think is so cool the liver actually slows those things down and that means that you're going to have more circulating toxin and so what we have to do is make sure those nutrients are there for the liver so none of that happens so we can avoid that problem so bowels open pooping every day liver supported by nutrients. We've talked a lot about saunas and sweating, uh, rebounders, anything that we can do. Exercise, of course, is such a great way to get circulation going. Um, but there, there's countless ways to get a sweat on. Just put some sweats on and turn the heat up um, and get that sweat going. Then rinsing with cool water to get the toxins off, to close those pores up so you aren't reabsorbing it. Breath work is certainly helpful. Again, alcohol is a great example here. Um, we use breathalyzers to, to measure that toxin in your, in your system, and that's true for lots of toxins. CO2 is even a toxin in, in large amounts in the body. And so having mind, taking mindful breaths, having a breath practice can be really, really, really helpful in terms of getting the toxic burden down. And then water, drinking enough water so those kidneys... Um, making sure that you're getting lots of filtered, high-quality water from a, a non-contaminated source, certainly, but then also making sure it's not in plastic, that it's in glass, ceramic, or stainless, so that you're not absorbing more chemicals from the plastic. So a few things to think about there. Okay. So looking at the topic of how do we decrease exposure and how do we decrease exposure in our environment, obviously we just beg the question of water filters and air filters. And uh -huh. But I'll, I'll come back because I want to do kind of more of a 
holistic picture on neuropsych first, and we'll, we'll drill in deeper to the parts of it. But just because you mentioned one part a number of times, and I don't know that it's obvious for everybody, when you said bowel movements and why it's important to have bowel movements, I, I think most anyone who hasn't had bowel movements for a period of time has a, has a first-person sense that uh, that's not that pleasant. But in terms of the relationship of the liver to the bowels and to bowel movements and what's happening, um, why is it important for toxin elimination in particular that bowel movements occur? Oh, I love this because I get to use a really big fancy word, enterohepatic recirculation. So what that means is that the liver does all this amazing processing of all your toxins and then spits it out into the gallbladder, if you have one, or the bowels, as a toxic sludge called bile. And then bile goes into your gut. And if it sits there for a long time, so if you're constipated, if you're not having a regular bowel movement, then the body, again, in all of its wisdom, it will reabsorb that because there's valuable stuff in there, stuff like cholesterol. And over an evolutionary period, we didn't always get enough fat. And so the body needed to conserve that fat. And it had a reason for wanting to be able to reabsorb bile because bile does contain cholesterol and that cholesterol is the building blocks for lots of sex hormones and stress hormones and things that we need to heal and be healthy. But if you're constipated and you absorb too much of that, when you'll have high cholesterol, but there's toxins in there. That's that toxic sludge and the liver's already done all this hard work to get these toxins out and ready for elimination, which is actually having a bowel movement. And if it's just sitting there, if you're not having that bowel movement, then it will come back into the bloodstream. It's going to go back to your liver. When you're asking your liver to do yesterday's work, take out yesterday's trash. And two, it's recirculating. So now we have this opportunity presented where those toxins that your liver was so smart to get rid of, they're now going back to the bloodstream where they can go up to your brain. They can go to your big toe. They can go to your heart. They can go to your spleen. Either you're exposing your organs. They can get stored in your bones now instead of where we want them, which is outside of your body. Good. So uh, when we come back to how do we support the body detoxing and saunas and all like that, we might go deeper. But that um, is at least an initial source of um, thinking about exposure to toxicity. And this can obviously be things that the body is supposed to be exposed to, just being exposed to too much, which we didn't talk about, like sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or like any food that we're eating too much of. It can even be our own metabolic waste products if the body can't clear them because it's already uh, dealing with too much load. Uh, or it can be these exogenous sources that we're talking about. Um, so one of the things that's kind of interesting is that when we, <clears throat> when we uh, look at the toxins that we commonly find in blood or in urine or in breast milk, most all of them either are endocrine disruptors or carcinogens or neurotoxins. And so when we think about the effect on health, obviously we're gonna see effects on all kinds of systems, but when we think about the effects on the nervous system in particular, right, and the neuroendocrine system, mm -hmm. um, we see this widely. So when people are coming to you and you run, I mean, most of the people who are coming to you don't work in um, industrial factories, right? They have normal kinds of exposures. Mm -hmm. What percentage of people are you finding meaningfully elevated toxins of some kinds in? Unfortunately, almost all. Yeah, unfortunately, almost all people <clears throat> that I see have some degree of elevated toxin. If we're measuring, and to be fair, we're measuring because we think that it might be there, um, but nearly all of my patients have some degree of elevated toxins, whether it's mycotoxins, the heavy metals, or the, the chemical toxins. Um, and so we, a detox is, is a great place to start with most people. Now, um, and, and that's why, is because toxins are so ubiquitous in the environment and not to scare people. You know, I think that this is manageable and if we are doing a good job eating the right foods and making sure that we're not getting toxic foods, opening the windows, uh, having daily bowel movements, getting plenty of sleep because that's a, a time when our body is upregulating a lot of these detox processes, then people can live healthy, happy lives. Don't get me wrong but they are ubiquitous and they are in the system. And 
Uh, toxins are causal, certainly, but they also, they're not all mutually exclusive, right? We can also have stealth infections. And sometimes it's that the first step is that the toxin, toxic exposure, maybe as a child or through a hobby or whatever it is, through an amalgam, um, through poor detox genetics, something has predisposed us to this toxic burden that now has affected our immune system, that now is affecting our neuroendocrine system. And that makes us predisposed now to an infection. And then this infection, those stealth infections, particularly uh, things in the Lyme category, um, Yersinia, HS, the herpes viruses, there's a whole host of them. But those can start to produce their own toxins. So now we have this self-perpetuating problem that um, is going to lead to more and more symptoms down the road. So um, is that kind of what you were referring to? Yeah. So now, um, the, the first part of the question was just, you know, how ubiquitous is it? And very the answer ends up being ubiquitous and that even when <clears throat> we're looking at say what someone's level of fire retardant in their blood is, mm -hmm. and we say, Oh, it's not that bad. It's in the 50th percentile. What that means is it's average across everyone that is in orders of magnitude more than anyone in our evolutionary time period had exposure to. Right. Um, so you know, there, there's actually a whole normativity problem in the fact that the average is actually already <laughs> pathological. Right. And like what I was explaining with in California during the drought, everybody had these ridiculously high herbicide and pesticide and glyphosate levels, right? And for some people, they still were able to maintain healthy lifestyles. For other people, that was probably debilitating and they had no idea why. Mm -hmm. And so... If we don't get into addressing any of the other parts yet, and we just look at effects of appropriate detox. Now, the first thing is, if someone has elevated mercury versus elevated lead versus mm -hmm. elevated styrene or mycotoxin, we don't get rid of them optimally in the same way. There is some overlap. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs bowel movements and sweating and et cetera. But um, if we just identified toxic exposure, we work to shut off the sink so that we, we were stopping the exposure source, and then we work to detox. If we didn't address their genetics or their deficiency or infection or hormones or anything else, um, how much improvement do you see with just that component? Yeah, you know, so two things here. One, I don't see that always being enough. And usually by the time people make it to my office, they've been through a cleanse. They've done a lot of this. Um, and there's something else that's still not quite clicking. And so we have to be a little bit more aggressive or dig a little bit deeper. Um, and then the other piece is that I never do one thing at a time, right? I really, it's important to me that every patient comes back and says, Hey, Dr. Sanderson, like I feel way better. Um, and so I, and I have this constant, like all, my entire day is I want to give people everything that I possibly can so that they feel better yesterday. And I also don't want to overwhelm them either financially or just like when you're not feeling well and you're, you have brain fog and you, like you're juggling being a mom and working and all of these other things and not getting enough sleep, then the thought of doing, of adding 18 things to your daily schedule is just too much. And so I, I have to figure out this balance for every individual that comes into my office is how much can you take on to do, but it's never just one thing. So we're always going to help support whatever the pathway is that appears to be dysregulated. So if someone has sleep issues, then I'm certainly going to try to help a ton with the sleep. That's also so foundational. So bowel movements and sleep is so foundational. If you don't have your sleep regulated and you're not getting enough rest, then nothing's going to get better. Um, so I would, I would go after that pretty aggressively and start a detox program. And a detox program always includes all of the amongtories and potentially something that's very specific, especially if I have a good lab back, right? So if it's lead, the approach is going to be different. It's going to be more EDTA versus if it's mercury, we're going to use more DMPS, which are chelating agents. The tests are so helpful because I can be that much more specific. Um, there are some things that are applied to almost everyone in terms of turning up detox processes. And then there are other things that are, are really specific if we can identify what the toxin is. So obviously all of this is deeply outside of the realm of what we would normally consider in psychiatry. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, in psychiatry, we're normally not looking at testing at all, right? We're doing some... Mm -hmm. uh, usually sadly minimal symptomatic assessment, some DSM diagnosis, and then straight to drug. 
And before giving someone a dopaminergic or an SSRI, there isn't even a test that is looking at something like serotonin levels, let alone what other things might be going on. So this is all... I have to hand it to some of the integrative psychiatrists have started, started running the genetic testing and they pick a med based on how you metabolize things based on a few SNPs. So I have to say they're, they're trying, they're making an effort. Um, but well, that's, that's already speaking to the cutting edge... I mean, the, to the forward, forward part of the bell curve. Right, yes. And yet things that would be underlyingly causing some of the neuropsych dynamics, which is why the person's issue has gotten worse over time or whatever, aren't. Um, which mercury can cause psychosis. I mean, that is, I mean, it's probably in the D- DSM somewhere. Well, Mad Hatter's disease is the, is the acute version of that, right? Um, and just like Mad Hatter's disease has an acute version, the, the subclinical version of it is a slow progression into mm-hmm. similar dynamics. Okay. okay. So you mentioned toxicity and then you've also mentioned, but let's get into uh, pathogens and deficiency. So uh, when we're looking at the underlying causes of why a nervous system could get dysregulated, because again, we're talking here about uh, someone's mood and emotion, their psychological state and their cognitive state, right? Mm-hmm. Neurocognitive psychiatric type things. But we're looking at the physiology of it. We're not looking at the psychology of it, which we'll get to in a little bit is how do we know when someone's depressed, if it really is primarily trauma and meaning making mm-hmm. at the psychological level, how do we know if it's physiologic, some of both feedback loops, but as we just stay looking at the way that physiology is affecting psychology and we're stay looking at um, kind of the, actual high level causes. So of course it might cascade into an issue with serotonin or an issue with dopamine or an issue with neuroinflammation that affects all the receptor sites for serotonin and dopamine. Mm -hmm. The question would be, okay, what is the underlying source of the neuroinflammation that is doing that or what's affecting the conversion factors? So we mentioned that toxins, which basically means too much of something for what the genetics evolved to be able to process well, where now they have to go into pathophysiology, some altered function to deal with the presence of that thing. And the altered mm-hmm. function might have a uh, psychiatric as well as other types of uh, symptomology. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about <clears throat> in terms of other tier one kind of causes, pathogens. You mentioned a little bit about, again, we're not talking about acute infection, Right. The chronic stealth, yeah, infections certainly are going to cause fatigue. You know, I think another piece there is they can cause pain and inflammation. And if you're in, if you're fatigued, if you're in pain, if you're inflamed, you don't feel good. Nobody feels like getting out of bed with that. You feel irritable, cranky. It's hard to sleep. And again, you get in this self perpetuating roller coaster of horrible symptoms I feel for my patients that come in with with this laundry list of neurological psychological issues they can't work it's hard to be in relationships it's hard to get along with anybody it's hard to get anything done and have that feeling of self-worth if you really just don't feel good every day or if you can't predict the days you're going to feel good and the days that you're not it's hard to hold the job down Um, so the self-infections that Yes, that's a whole long conversation about what can come up there. The nutrients I get a little more jazzed about because I think I, there's so much low-hanging fruit there. I think that that's why I'm drawn more towards the, the nutrients is because it's not that expensive. So it's really accessible to a lot more people than I think realize. Um, and then it works really quickly. So within about two, three weeks, people know, have a noticeable change, a noticeable shift. All right. Um, all right. Hang on. We'll get there. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. So let's at least <laughs> do a broad overview so people at least have some sense people have a sense that there is this thing called a gut brain axis that is becoming popular and Mm -hmm. there's a few different dynamics going on, but that microbes are part of it, Mm -hmm. that the microbiome is a part of it, that microbiome is involved, that there's good bugs that are involved in uh, the production of neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. Um, And not just production of neurotransmitters, but things like the processing of nutrients that help brains work or, um, but then uh, the idea that there are subclinical infections, that's just not really a common idea. Like a kind of environmental toxin wasn't really a common idea. Right. Yeah. And whether we're talking about dental or nasal or GI pathogens or mm-hmm. you know, blood-borne pathogens, let's just touch. Is that, is, that, is that actually a thing? 
<laughs> Absolutely. How, and how do we know it's a thing? And again, is this something that's always been, or is a little bit more common and uh, in, in common currently? So just uh, so. yeah. So uh, you know, the ubiquitous use of antibiotics, and, and like we were talking about there being antifungals in the paint. <clears throat> like there's antifungals on foods, on your clothes, on your couch. There's anti microbial agents are everywhere. And so again, just like we were talking about in the environment, in our environment, in our body, um, there are Marcons and MRSA, which are very drug resistant pathogens. And they can, you know, there's two things here going on. One is colonization. So it's not an active infection. It's not actually in your system causing an, an infection, but the colonization of some of these organisms can also lead to inflammation. So that's when they live on the mucosal surface. And there's some degree of normal colonization maybe, but there can also be imbalances in that. So maybe there's too much of a good thing or a totally absent good thing or too much of a bad thing. We get uh, this, it's a very complex milieu of, um, of good and bad bugs in the mucosal system. And we talk about gut mucosa a lot. I think one thing people forget is the sinuses are another mucosal system um, that's connected to the gut and also to the eustachian tubes. Um, and then in women, certainly the vaginal ecosystem is another place where things can get can be off often frequently and that can create feedback loops to the brain. Um, and then the skin is another place. So, um, all of these places we are thinking about microbes, fungal. I was just uh, pointing to dental. Oh, dental. Thank you. Yes. I thought you couldn't hear me in my mic. No, dental. Yeah, absolutely. I was at the dentist this morning and she was like, you know, we need to look at this. Um, the water pick, that's what I, I went home with, um, with some hydrogen peroxide in it. So all of these systems, and I have a bunch of tips. The kimchi juice is one of my favorite things. It's so cheap. It's so easy. I heard about it from a friend of mine who's an acupuncturist, and it hit so many of my patients who have had sinus infections, long-term chronic sinus infections. You just take a Q-tip, put it in some kimchi, and then stick it in your nose. And there is a particular pathogen. Don't ask me to try to say that name, but there's a, sorry, not a pathogen. There's a particular probiotic that can colonize the sinuses that um, can reduce inflammation and, and stop those chronic sinus infections really in a profound way for about five bucks from the health food store. So that's a fun one. Do you have other other directions you want to go with pathogens? I mean, we could go so, stool testing, Marcon's testing. The testing is, is long. We can do a SIBO testing, breath so testing. Again, just to have a, have a sense, since part of the – when we think about infection in a kind of modern medical allopathic sense, we think of acute infection. Mm -hmm. um, or if we think of a long-term infection, it's something like – uh, hepatitis C or HIV or something that, you know, we, we know we have, right? Well, in hep C, a lot of people don't know they have it, actually. That can be a chronic long-term awesome. infection. Yeah. But so in the same way that hep C over the course of a long period of time can affect people's health, you know, radically, there's a lot of things that are in the category of subclinical. We don't usually test for them, have an effect. So I want to ask a question similar to toxins. When people are coming in with psychiatric presentation or other chronic complex health dynamics and you go ahead and start testing for pathogens mm -hmm. whether we're talking about um, bacteria parasite virus yeast etc gut dental blood um, how often do you see some kinds of elevated pathogens meaning active living infection in their system yeah. Well, every time we look again, it's like the toxins, you know, if we're looking, we're looking because we think it's probably there. And, um, if people are sick, there's usually some degree of imbalance in the flora. So whether it's in the gut, in the stool or in blood, you know, it, in some pocket, there's an imbalance. Um, and I don't know if that's always causal. Like we've had this, we've already said this a few times during this conversation, but I really do think that, the toxins set the stage, typically, not always, it's either genetics, nutrients, toxins, something else typically sets the stage so that that infection then can take hold. A lot of these things that we're looking at are things like CB, CMV, CBV, EBV, CMV, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, the ones that cause mono, um, herpes viruses, 
even lime, the, the Borrelias, these are pretty ubiquitous in the environment, right? So most people have been exposed to these at some level. There's an nature paper from late 2017, I think, maybe uh, in the last 18 months. And it was talking about how Borrelia is in not just ticks, but it's in fleas and mosquitoes and pretty much all of these vectors have some degree of Borrelia that they can transfer to us. Now, why is it, this is similar to the mold, that one person is affected symptomatically and another person isn't? I think there's a couple things that play into that. And, and again, these are our tier one causal level parameters. It's the toxic burden, it's the genetic predisposition, and it's the nutrients, either too much or too little. So too much sugar is going to create create a wonderful environment to, for yeast to grow in, right? Too little protein is going to create a totally different environment something else is going to grow in. Uh, whether or not you methylate, going back to genetics, is going to create another environment that might predispose you to some other pathogen. So those pathogens are there, and we want to treat them. We want to be aware of them. We want to understand the immune system. But I don't feel like they're always the cause. I think that there's some other element that makes people more susceptible. And that's why one person can get bit by a Lyme infected tick and be debilitated. And then another person could get bit by a same, the same tick or another one that's infected and not really show up manifest with symptoms. So that's why I like playing in the arena of the nutrients, the genetics and the toxins. And yet when we're dealing with complex cases, actually noticing the infections and working with them ends up being something that almost always is part of the picture. Yeah, yes, that's true. And especially gut, especially gut infections. I, you know, I say that and then like all of last summer, all I did was treat parasites. <laughs> um, so, and, and that's actually been really, really fun because um, I love seeing people get better. And so many people got better. And these were people that had been to specialist after specialist after specialist and weren't getting anywhere. And then we treated them for parasites and they made leaps and bounds and improvement. So that, mm -hmm. that's very satisfying. I love that. All right. Now you may go into nutrients. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Bill Walsh, love him. Um, and on the neurocognitive psycho-emotional piece, um, testing, the Walsh protocol is usually where I start. And the reason I start there is because it's so profoundly effective. It's been the most profound thing that I have introduced into my practice since starting. Um, and we're looking at just five parameters. It's relatively inexpensive testing. Um, we're looking at whole blood histamine and homocysteine to measure methylation status. We're looking at zinc and copper, and not just for those numbers, those finite numbers, but for the ratio between them, making sure those copper and zinc ratios are squared away, and then looking at urine cryptopyrals. So we talked about nutrients and how that might affect levels of neurotransmitters. Zinc and um, B6, vitamin B6, are the two cofactors that are necessary for converting glutamate to GABA. So this is a super simple way to illustrate how much of a role nutrients have on our mood. So glutamate is very important. It's one of our most abundant neurotransmitters. I think it is the most abundant neurotransmitter. It comes from glutamine one of the most abundant amino acids in our system. And glutamate is helpful. It helps us to pay attention. It helps us with focus. It helps with a lot of things, but it also causes anxiety, and particularly when there is too much of it. And glutamate, very simply and easily with enough B6 and zinc, turns into GABA. And GABA is that feeling that you have after a glass of wine, it's the feeling I have after a glass of wine, where nothing is as big of a deal anymore. You can just like sit back, relax. It's that Friday afternoon feeling. That's GABA. That helps you get to sleep. And if you don't have enough of it, if you cannot convert that glutamate to GABA, you won't get there. You won't feel like, everything will feel like a bigger deal and it will be difficult to sleep. And so measuring zinc and B6 um, well, is very important directly, but urine cryptopyrals are also a reflection of this. Urine cryptopyrals have nothing to do with neurotransmitters, except for that they are part of the breakdown of hemoglobin. And they, it requires that metabolism of cryptopyrals requires zinc and B6, just like the neurotransmitter processes. So what we can do is assume that if you have a, lar a high number of urine cryptopyrals, then you're not making that conversion because you don't have the cofactors to do it. And we can assume that that's probably also happening in the brain and with the balance of neurochemistry there. So 
we add to think and be sick, surprise, surprise. And the profound results are, um, are really, really satisfying for me to see in practice. It's so fun when I have a mom come in and tell me, thank you. I'm so much nicer to my children, so much nicer to my husband. It's really, really wonderful. Um, and it's, it's just so nice to see people who can get back to work and get back to doing the things that they love and connecting with the people they love because their neurochemistry is balanced. And it doesn't have to be a benzo. It doesn't have to be an SSRI. It doesn't have to be something that has side effects that make you feel fat or, you know, have antidote, have no, um, make you feel numb to the world. You can just feel more like yourself. I had a, a child come in not that long ago and um, he said to me, he said, now I feel like I control my brain instead of my brain controlling me. And, and that was really <clears throat> it was so sweet to hear. So that's why I like to talk about the nutrients. So you're talking about the ratio of zinc to copper. Mm-hmm. And we oh, yeah. talked a little bit about... Uh, some things that zinc does. So zinc is involved in conversion of glutamate to GABA. It's also involved in the conversion of the amino acids into neurotransmitters across several other ones, tyrosine into dopamine, Dopamine. 5-HTP into serotonin. Um, But the ratio of zinc to copper is important. And there are some people that are deficient or excessive ratio-wise in either direction and need treated differently. Um, you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So this is more common in women. So more often than not, it's a, a female who comes in. Typically there's a hormonal component. So women who are very sensitive to hormones, the picture is postpartum depression onset with either puberty or menopause, pregnancy, um, or cyclic. So every time a woman gets a period or ovulates, she's has, um, extreme anxiety or depression. Um, One of the things you can look for is white spots on your fingernails. That's one of the indications that there might be a zinc copper imbalance. That um, is is so simple and easy to treat and women don't have to, and men too experience this. I don't want to exclude them, but uh, they don't have to live like that. And what we do is we measure and the zinc should be slightly higher than the copper. Um, and we measure specific, specific, num- uh, we use a specific lab and we have to be pretty, you need to know what you're looking for there. Um, what happens is that, you know, naturally in the environment, so like oysters are a great example. They have lots of minerals. They have both copper and zinc and so do greens. And they come into our system in about a one-to-one ratio, which is exactly where we want them. We want a slightly more zinc than copper, but they're at about one-to-one. And what I'll see is that women will have copper that's like double and triple the zinc. And it's a genetic predisposition. So that's another thing that I ask all of my patients is what, was there any mental health in your family? How about substance abuse? Because a lot of times, if there's a lot of alcoholism, people are self-medicating. If there's a lot of substance abuse, people are, are trying to feel better. They're trying to find something to get rid of that discomfort. And um, so it's, it's not anyone's fault. It's not that you were eating the wrong foods. These foods come into our system in this one-to-one ratio. And then genetically, we sometimes sequester the copper. So that can often throw off these ratios. So it means that when you are eliminating, which hopefully you're doing every day, um, you are getting rid of the zinc, but not the copper. You're hanging on to the copper. And every oyster you eat, you hang on to 1.5 of the copper and get rid of a bunch of the zinc. And so now our ratios are off. Um, So that's what we're looking at. And people ask, so do I have to be on this forever? And the short answer is yes, pretty much. We want to keep testing, but it's it's a genetic thing. It's a genetic predisposition to sequester the copper typically and to release more of the zinc, to eliminate more of the zinc. So we have to correct that with um, supplementation, but it's very inexpensive. You know, a bottle of zinc can be 10, 12 bucks for 30 days. So uh, for those who are interested in this specific part of nutrients, which uh, Heather mentioned the Walsh Institute, uh, work of Bill Walsh, and which is moving forward the body of work of Dr. Pfeiffer from Harvard and many people, um, Dr. Walsh has a number of YouTube videos where he describes overmethylation and undermethylation and cryptopyroluria and different dynamics that are um, really fascinating where you can kind of learn more about if it seems like something you'd like to pursue testing further. Yeah, he's great. And just to let your listeners know, Dr. Walsh has been doing this since the 70s. He's got 
35, 40,000 patients in his database. So this is not some esoteric, like maybe this works nutrient kind of peripheral medicine thing. No, this is like the largest mental health database on the planet. Um, it's a no bullshit, like lots and lots and lots of literature, lots of research. Um, and Dr. Walsh has worked with people on all ends of the spectrum, both optimizing function and then creativity, neuroplasticity, and then also on the opposite end with, um, you know, horrible psychoses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and I see patients that, that suffer with that as well. Um, so we, get, we can get some really profound results, and this has a ton of, of experience and wisdom behind it. We didn't just make this up last year. This, and um, Do you mind if I talk about the methylation piece? Because I think that sure. one's an important one, and a lot of questions come up about that because of the MTHFR is like the Kim Kardashian of SNPs. It's like so famous. Everybody is like talking about the MTHFR, um, single nucleotide polymorphism, the SNP. And I see people running, my patients running into a lot of trouble there. They assume that because they have one polymorphism, one variant or mutation, I don't think of it as a mutation. We are all genetic miracles. The fact that we're here is amazing. But there's one SNP that's not the wild type and they think, okay, I've got to get myself all this methylated B12 and methylfolate. The issue is that that folate in any form, if there's depression, will actually downregulate serotonin. You might have an, a little bit of upregulation temporarily, but over time, any form of folate, whether it's methylated or not, is going to downregulate serotonin. So if depression, and especially serotonin-related depression, so somebody that's responded well to an antidepressant like an SSRI, they will not do well with folate. And I see a lot of psychiatrists giving out folate in this case, and a lot of um, well-intentioned providers and patients um, reaching for folate when I, I don't think that that's a good idea. I think it's actually contraindicated. So MTHFR, it can be meaningful, but it is only instructions. It is not actually what's happening. And that's why I like using Dr. Walsh's work is because it's the phenotype. It's what's actually happening in the system. So when we measure histamine and homocysteine, we're looking at parameters of uh, things that need methylation in order to be metabolized. And so we can assume if they're quite high, especially if both are quite high, then methylation is not happening. If they're very low, then it means too much methylation is happening. Now, this is important from both a nutritional standpoint Right? We might not have enough methyl B12 in the system. We might not have enough SAMe, acetinacyl methionine. We might not have enough trimethylglycine to methylate if we're under methylators. Or we might be doing too much of that too quickly. Um, now, so both of those are an option. I think when you are only looking at MTHFR, that that question only goes in one direction. Everyone says, oh, I don't methylate. I don't methylate. I don't methylate, even if they just have one SNP, which, which just isn't true. It's potential. That, that's potential. But what we want to look at is the phenotype. Now, the other thing here is that methylation, so methylation from a nutritional standpoint, methyl B12, methylfolate, uh, TMG, SAMI, all of these things are really important from just a level. Do you have enough? The other piece here is that they turn on and off genetics. So when I see a patient and I start doing a Walsh treatment plan, I expect there to be change within about two weeks. And that's typically because of that nutritional component. At about six months, we get a plateau. So what's happening between two, months and six, two weeks and six months is that there is a shift in the genetic expression. And that is because of those methyl donors. So when we add more methyl donors, it starts to change what genetics get expressed. So we talked about single nucleotide polymorphisms being the instructions and the potential and that those instructions and potential it gets turned off or on based on methylation and and some other things some other complex things turn on and off um, certain sections of your genome but methylation is certainly a very very important one so that's why you know i don't want to be too reactive and um, we want to see how things play out when we start a walsh protocol and people are still getting benefit four five and six months later Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dr. Walsh's approach to methylation is really kind of in its own category, which is looking at holistic methylation levels. So he talks about under or over methylators rather than looking at which specific part of a methylation pathway might be up or down regulated. Because when you look at the genetics, you might see a particular gene is overexpressing, another gene is underexpressing, but you've got a dozen genes to look at that are obvious and then several dozen other genes and then the, that are related and the combinatorics. So 
it's an advancing field. Absolutely. So early. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, being able to factor people's genetic predispositions while looking at what's expressing at the level of chemistry is a, is a sage approach to start. Certainly, certainly. And, you know, even in the breakdown of histamine, we need B vitamins and we need zinc and we need vitamin C. And so it's not just about <clears throat> one nutrient. It's about making sure that people have a robust, healthy level of, of all of the nutrients that are required for these things. And we can get specific when we have the right numbers in front of us, which is nice. Something that I want to, to just share with listeners here regarding Dr. Walsh's work. So, you know, Walsh was the person that really started pioneering this concept of uh, methylation work a long time before uh, 23andMe was ubiquitous. And we were looking at methylation genes, um, you know, as well as this whole idea of cryptopyroluria, and et cetera. Um, it was actually studying Walsh's work that had me decide to, uh, it was a major step in having me start Neurohacker. Um, it was specifically work he did with Argonne National Lab studying criminal mental illness and looking at neurochemical and neurostructural patterns that uh, predispose different types of criminal mental illness. And we look at violent psychopaths or violent sociopaths or violent schizophrenics and say, you know, if someone has an impulse control disorder, so they normally have empathy, but they can do impulse control versus someone really never has empathy. They have d- dissociation dynamics versus someone has um, psychosis. Are there any patterns that we can identify chemically that are the same within that class that are both different than normal people and different than the other classes that we could actually start treating and maybe even preventing? Mm-hmm. And the answer is not a perfect yes to everything with a a single pill, but the answer was actually a radical yes to a lot of things, meaning of, you know, we we know some famous cases where there was a person who was a totally well-adjusted, normal person, uh, didn't have any kind of violent traits, and then uh, had some violent show up seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, Washington Shooter was a classic example, said, look at my brain. They look at the brain, they see a brain tumor that is uh, pressing on specific regions of the brain involved in things like impulse control brain tumors removed and the violent tendency is gone it actually brings up a very deep question from a jurisprudence point of view of do you punish that person do do you you know do you do brain scans routinely for people as a way of preventing criminality um right now as we're looking at mass shooting cases and we're looking at the correlation of mass shooting cases with recent psychiatric medicine prescriptions where someone is put on an ssri for the first time uh, within three months before the shooting happens. And we say, oh, well, one of the side effects of a misprescribed SSRI is homicidal tendencies. And suicide. <clears throat> suicidal tendencies. I, mean, I think that I, I personally have been affected by that. Friends who have been put on SSRIs and then commit suicide. Um, and I think a lot of people have experienced that, know someone who's, who's suffered. Um, yeah, the... the Keep going, but I want to talk about the benzos as well. Yeah, so this, you know, this really was core to Neurohacker. Was looking at, we we were looking first at um, just what are all of the things that affect human experience in terms of macroeconomics, in terms of education, in terms of governance, in terms of uh, all kinds of psychology dynamics. And then what are the things that don't just affect human experience, but also affect human behavior, predispositions for behavior? When you see that, uh, of course, something like impulse control or empathy is going to mediate how somebody behaves. Mm -hmm. And of course, that runs on neural networks and is mediated by chemistry. And almost everybody knows that their behavior is different in ways that can be dangerous on drugs, certain kinds of drugs, or if their hormones are out of balance, they might access certain emotions a lot easier, other ones a lot harder. And so what we're starting to explore is how do we, and what this whole conversation is about, why Heather and I have explored it a lot together is how do we uh, support the health of the nervous system and the physiology in a way that doesn't just support the health of the nervous system and the physiology, but that supports both the felt sense of subjective well-being of the people, their fundamental neuropsychological capabilities, and also their predispositions, because basically violent and shitty behavior is actually a sign of an unwell person. 
And uh, so Dr. Walsh is one of the pioneers in that space. Yeah, certainly he did find patterns in that study in the criminal justice system. He was finding patterns and certainly urine Euro, cryptopyrals were, were one of the common themes and, and low zinc and copper. And I was at a conference in um, last fall and there was a presentation about Syrian refugee camps and the food that's being delivered there and how low in nutrients it is and how high in glyphosate, because of course they're getting grains shipped from overseas that are, have been genetically modified and laden with herbicides and pesticides and that they were seeing shifts in behavior in that community. And that wasn't totally related because, and you could parse it out because you had some communities that were getting the, the grains from overseas and other people that there's actually a, um, like a, a black market for non GMO grains in these refugee camps because people notice how they feel and they feel so different and it, it affects the population um, and the behavior of people in that population profoundly and uh, how when there's trauma and then there's nutrient deficiencies and then there's, you know, these, these horrible situations and this certainly community, but this, this separation from home and all so many awful things happening. How do you break those patterns? And I think part of what we're recognizing is that toxins in food and then poor nutrients on a population level can certainly uh, create more, pathology such a heartbreaking pathology and so we're doing what we can certainly mm -hmm. to be part of the solution um, so, be, so beyond the wall stuff mm -hmm. when you talk about nutrients yeah so and deficiency so what else if low fatty acids low amino acids yeah. low trace minerals of other kinds what what, yeah. what else do you look for so um Depending on your insurance, and our, my team does such a good job looking at whose insurance covers what, and we work with lots and lots of labs to try to get people the most information for the least amount of money. Um, and so it kind of depending on that, we look at different things, but we can look intracellularly, we can look in the extracellular space, we can look in hair, um, we can look at, you know, if we're looking at T cells versus hair, we're looking at different amounts, lengths of time and averages over that time. Um, so it really, it depends how we look, we look at that based on a number of factors. Um, and, and again, based on your diet and exposures and, um, what do I think that you might be getting enough of or not too much of, um, and what, what diets have been helpful for you in the past? What have you tried? What have you not tried? So there's a few ways that I measure and get information about nutrients. NAD plus is one that comes up a lot in, mental health and stress in addiction disorders. So NAD plus is niacinamide adenine dinucleotide. And um, there's been a bit of research going on in Australia with that. And I've been using it in my clinic. There's people all over the US are using it um, to prepare people for detox programs, um, not detox the way we were talking about it, but more of a um, like inpatient detox from, from drugs and alcohol. Um, so, NAD plus is done by IV. And what I've seen is basically whenever there's very, very high stress, so whether it's mental, emotional stress, maybe a surgery, a stroke, or addiction, long-term addiction, people deplete their B vitamins. And one of the primary ones is this NAD. It's vitamin B3. It's a form of niacin. And so when we replete that, when we flood the body with it, all of a sudden stress resilience goes back up and people feel normal again. They start sleeping better. They have less anxiety, less depression, and uh, feel much more resilient to stress whenever that does come up because of course stress is a normal part of life i did it recently and it it, it, it was a game changer mm -hmm. yeah so the uh nad iv therapy a lot of people listening to this have probably seen uh the product elysium uh which mm -hmm. is nicotinamide riboside which is a precursor to nad you can take orally um <clears throat> and even just taking just nicotinamide or niacin, which is why it, it's actually been used in kind of orthomolecular mental health for a long time. And there's a number of things that it does. Um, this isn't just mental health; it's, it's associated with longevity and, but uh, anti-aging and skin. Yeah, lots of things. This particular pathway of NAD plus NADH inside of cells actually is one of the main pathways for redox signaling. So mm -hmm. oxidation reduction signaling. And so it's kind of like an aging pathway. If you, uh, if you get the NAD plus to NADH ratios in better place, that's just healthier, younger cells. So being able to 
do it orally is nice. Being able to bypass that and go straight to in byproduct straight into the vein is a cool therapy. It's profound. So like the Walsh work, I mean, the, if I had to put them in order, it would be Walsh number one and NAD plus number two. The, the profound effects I've seen with patients have are I'll get emotional if I talk about it too much, but it's just so amazing to see someone's life shift in a matter of three days and see them, um, see them have that resilience, build that resilience back and be able to take on the world again and, and share their gifts with the world um, after you know, just three days of getting IVs. I, yeah. So two other quick ones on nutrients because I think they're ones that a, yeah. a lot of people are somewhat aware of, fatty acid deficiencies. Mm-hmm. And so... If, Fatty acids in the nervous system. So uh, cholesterol numbers, um, this is where I really have a beef with the conventional community. Um, cholesterol under 200 is only the goal if you have heart disease and di- or diabetes. It is not the goal if you are a healthy human. Um, and cholesterol under 150, and I start to worry that you have depression, that you will have erectile dysfunction, that you will... Uh, I, I hope you don't get hurt because it will be difficult for you to recover from that if you don't have enough cholesterol. So cholesterol is the backbone for sex hormones and stress hormones, and it is so necessary in the right amounts. Now, there are ratios, and total cholesterol doesn't tell us a whole whole lot. We need to look at the fractionated levels, so small density LDLs. How is your HDL? What does your ApoB look like? Um, There's a lot of numbers. What are triglycerides looking like? Those are more important to me than total cholesterol. Um, anytime I see someone on a satin, I'm doing everything I can to get them off in a safe and healthy way. That is a contributing factor to cognitive decline. It is a contributing factor to dementia. It's a con- contributing factor to depression. So, um, good, healthy, um, amino acids and fatty acids are so, so, so important. Also the brain is made of fat, right? We all know this brain is made of fat. Signaling systems require fat. We've, we've got to have enough fat. Even people trying to lose weight, you have to have enough fat to lose weight. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but it is necessary. Omega-3, omega-6 ratio? Yeah, so um, we measure. <laughs> we look all the time. Definitely want to... Most of my patients, you know, by the time people see me, they're pretty well educated about this for the most part. But yeah, you want your omega-3s in your diet to be higher than your omega-6s. You're going to naturally have more omega-6s and you need them. They're, don't get me wrong. They're necessary as well. Omega-3s, 6s, and 9s. We want them all in a nice, healthy balance. Um, you are naturally going to have more omega-6s than, than 3s. But in the standard American diet, there is way, way, way more omega-6s immensely more. And so we have to actively be very selective and conscious about what we choose to eat so that we don't tip that balance in our bodies. And then, uh, so yeah, I I think most people don't even have to test to get on a DHA supplement as a generally good idea. Um, One of the other kind of pieces of nutrient-based uh, psychiatry that kind of penetrated the mainstream well was uh, Julia Ross amino acid therapies, yeah. mm-hmm. mood cure. Um, so tyrosine, 5-HTP, mm-hmm. DLPA, y- theanine. Yeah, so we need substrate. Acids. So we need substrate, right? So we've been talking about NADA, NAD, NAD+, plus, excuse me, zinc, um, and B6, and those are cofactors. So if we think about, if you take yourself back to like chemistry class, whenever that was, and you have A plus B and you want to turn A plus B into C, you sometimes need a cofactor like B6, zinc, all of these things. And if you have, if you don't have that cofactor, you're not going to make C, but if you don't have A or B, you're also not going to make C right? So the backbones of our neurotransmitters are the things that you just, that you were listing, the L-DOPA, the 5-HTP, the glutamine, all of these things are going to turn into neurotransmitters in our brain and they're typically amino acids. So we need to get amino acids from somewhere. If you enjoy a meat-free, animal-free diet, then you have to be getting them from plants, things like quinoa, um, beans, rice. You, you're an expert in this. What are some other great pro- plants? base proteins, soy. Uh, all of the vegetables are going to have some amino acids, not complete proteins. Um, your algaes are going to be complete proteins. Mm. Is complete protein. You can obviously get isolates of the protein portions of things like pea protein and rice protein, yeah. or protein. Otherwise, it's usually mixtures of seeds, nuts, legumes, those kinds mm-hmm. of things. 
But whether someone's getting dietary protein from plant sources or animal sources, um, if someone's getting enough dietary protein, uh, does that necessarily translate to us seeing healthy amino acid ratios in their blood? Yeah. So again, goes back to genetics, goes back to these cofactors and other nutrients. Um, no, not necessarily. You do not always make the right amount of the right brain chemistry just because you have the right diet. Now, I will say it makes a huge, huge, huge difference. And one of the first things that I do for anyone with anxiety and depression is say, have more protein. Where are you getting your protein from? How often are you having it? So blood sugar spikes and drops, not having enough of the substrate, all of these things can certainly contribute. And it's such an easy, quick, healthy way to get some balance in the system. So every two hours, high protein, high fat, high fiber, lots of veggies. If you struggle, especially with spikes and drops in blood sugar, then that can be super balancing for the brain and nervous system. Okay. <clears throat> so we've talked about subclinical, subacute toxins, subclinical, mm -hmm. subacute pathogens, and subclinical um, nutrient deficiencies, meaning yep. none of these would normally be diagnosed as acute pathology, but uh, any of them can lead to a dysregulation in the system that leads to more susceptibility to more of them. Mm -hmm. right? uh, obviously, the deficiency of amino acids, even if you eat enough protein, might be a GI absorption issue because of infection in the gut. Right? Or genetic, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and the infection in the gut might have been from glyphosate exposure messing the gut up. Um, and so we can see these cascades start to happen. And stress, I think stress is another important one to point out here because if you are in that fight, flight, freeze state and you don't go into your rest, digest, and heal state, if you don't have that dynamic ability to bounce back and forth between your parasympathetic and sympathetic states, then you won't create enough digestive enzymes and you won't absorb enough of your nutrients and you won't have enough of the substrate. You won't have enough of those amino acids, regardless of what you choose to put into your body. You'll never get enough into your bloodstream if you don't get to that rest, digest, and heal state. It also is going to predispose you to, yes, more nutrient, uh, excuse me, more flora imbalance because you're not digesting. So more things are fermenting. So there's going to be more yeast and there's going to be pathogen overload. Um, so the, the, I'm a naturopathic doctor, so of course I'm going to start in the gut um, and make sure that that's functioning. Okay, so I want to come back to um, stress in a minute, but since you just went to the gut, we've talked about the gut-brain axis from the point of view of um, bacteria, uh, mm -hmm. microbiome. Very common that people have deficiency of microbiome because of chlorine and water, because of antibiotics, because of etc. Mm -hmm. But obviously the connection between the gut and the brain is lots of things. It's are the nutrients getting into the blood? Is toxicity getting into the blood because of leaky gut dynamics, inflammation, enteric nervous system? I want to talk about the inflammation part for a minute because that's mm -hmm. obviously one of the deep reasons naturopaths are going to look at the gut to start. So I think another kind of breakthrough that has happened in our understanding of psychiatry in just recent years is starting to understand how ubiquitous neuroinflammation is in psychiatric presentation. And you've got now whole kind of communities of rheumatologists saying maybe depression is just rheumatology of the brain, right? It's kind of neuroinflammation. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I think inflammation and causes of it and yeah. Um, so zonulin is one of these fancy things that we can test in the gut nowadays. And that gives us a little bit of a sense of whether or not you have a leaky gut. So most people who have a leaky gut probably have a leaky blood brain barrier as well. So what we're talking about are these membranes that separate different pockets of the body. So that separate your gut. We're all basically glorified donuts, right? There's this hole in the middle and nothing is actually inside of you until it's crossed that gut barrier. And inflammation in that gut barrier um, it shows up as those cells and they're called cells because when we found, when we created the microscope and looked under the, looked in that Petri dish and saw the cells, they looked like cells in a cell block. They, there was, they were all lined up next to each other. And like a prison, um, there was somebody 
that w- there was a security guard there determining who would come in and who would go out. So there's a lot of selectivity. When we have an inflamed gut, there's, uh, these cells get bigger, they get less square, there's less security determining what comes in and out. So I think of it as like a promiscuous barrier. It's just like letting everything in. So that is going to lead to more inflammation and potentially cross-reactivity. The immune system is going to get uh, alerted that there are larger macromolecules crossing this barrier going into the bloodstream. And, um, and it's not self, it's not food, it's not a nutrient. And so the immune system needs to attack it. And that can lead to lots of inflammation. So that gut inflammation that can be caused by most commonly, it's going to be antibiotics, stress, alcohol, and then gluten, um, zonulin. So zonulin is in uh, wheat containing products. You can you put zonulin in that Petri dish with those gut cells and you can watch those tight junctions start to disappear. So super important that if there is an inflammatory process going on to eliminate those wheat containing products for the most part, and especially if there's autoimmune processes associated with that, some more systemic inflammation, um, probably starting in the gut. So reducing that inflammation, and there's a whole host of other things. So we talked about the four most common, the, the stress, the alcohol, the gluten-containing products, and um, antibiotics contributing to inflammation in the gut. There's a lot of others. Um, but though, if you just got a hold of those ones, you could make a lot of progress. And then some great things to reduce um, inflammation in the gut, aloe, licorice, glutamine. We talked about glutamine as a um, substrate for neurotransmitters, but it's also really, really great for healing leaky gut, as is collagen. Um, some of those bone broths that are very popular nowadays can be super helpful for reducing that inflammation, uh, both in the gut and then systemically, because that gut, and all of those things are actually helpful for the, the blood-brain barrier as well. Um, but that, that gut barrier is going to contribute. If that's inflamed, everything else is going to be just because of that process of what's getting absorbed across the barrier. So to come at it from another direction, let's talk about inflammation and mold exposure and mycotoxins. Mm-hmm. So inflammation <laughs> everywhere, anywhere. Um, I think I'm not really sure exactly what you're... So we, we can have inflammation start in the gut, uh-huh. but we can have it start from lots of places. Mm-hmm. Right? So obviously inhaling mycotoxin into the uh, nasal sinus lung, yeah. nasa, um, we can get kind of massive inflammatory dynamics. And so the, the brain fog and the depression and the psychoneural symptoms associated with mold are largely believed to be inflammatory mediated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we can measure those. So that's like Shoemaker contributed a lot of that to the field of mold and mycotoxins. Is he looks at downstream effect, uh, downstream effects. So instead of measuring directly the mycotoxins, he's looking at a whole host of inflammatory markers like C4A, TGF beta one. What else is on that panel? MMP9. I mean, the list is is long, um, but we're looking both centrally. So at, at stimulating hormones coming from the brain from the p- pituitary hypothalamic axis, um, and then also things in the periphery that are reflective of, of complement cascades and other things um, to show us that there is inflammation happening both in the central nervous system and then also in the periphery um, that can be leading to symptoms in pretty much in every system of the body. Um, and, and it all starts with inflammation, it starts with that reaction. Well, talk about sugar and inflammation. Um, so sugar the the yeast piece i mean is huge sugar too much or too little of anything the body's going to try to protect itself from um but sugar definitely is going to contribute to inflammation in lots of ways but first of all getting on this up and down sugar high sugar low um can contribute to all kinds of discomfort but also just having sugar um, is going to feed yeast in the system, especially too much of it and the wrong types of it. And then the whole conversation around fake sugars is another issue and how that's throwing off signaling to the brain. But I think all chronic disease, there are themes there, right? There's there's imbalances in signaling systems. There's imbalance in, in inflammation, and inflammation is a good thing. Like, let I don't want to forget that part of the conversation. That that even like something like acupuncture. I love acupuncture. If there's something wrong with me, that's where I go first. Um, and 
the whole premise of acupuncture is that you create this micro acute inflammatory process. And that kind of turns on the immune system that or it turns on this response system. It turns on this inflammatory process that is meant to lead to healing. It's designed that way. You're supposed to get red and it's supposed to be inflamed and it's supposed to hurt a little bit. So you protect it and you're supposed to bring attention and energy there. And that's the whole point. The issue with inflammation is when it becomes chronic and there aren't, there's this, this long-term signaling dysfunction, um, this pattern that's off that leads to long-term pain, long-term swelling, long-term symptoms. And those are the things that we're measuring, especially with the shoemaker panel. Um, and then go ahead with sugar, you're looking at insulin, you're looking at all kinds of parameters. Certainly triglycerides are part of that picture. Um, hemoglobin A1C, the glycosylation of things in the bloodstream and then at end organs can certainly cause damage. So glycosylation is that like with hemoglobin A1C, what we're measuring is the amount of sugar on your red blood cells. And glycosylation is that, that process by which sugar attaches to things. And that in and of itself is inflammatory and can damage, damage tissues. Is that kind of where you're going with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why. What's that? Yeah. Age, advanced glycation. Yeah, advanced glycation and products, exactly. And so that's why people have to cut their toes off when they have diabetes. That's why they lose their vision. These glycase, that glycase, glycosylation, um, it's how it affects the heart and blood flow to the heart um, when you have diabetes. Now you're talking about acute, I mean, kind of acute and chronic is something we've been talking about across this whole conversation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so if there's an acute signal and then there is a response and then it's addressed, awesome. If there's an acute signal and it doesn't get addressed and it continues or builds up, then now obviously we're in pathophysiology rather than just homeostasis. Mm -hmm. um, if we talk about pain, obviously pain is supposed to trigger a uh, immune response to some tissue that got damaged to both maybe immobilize it, right? Or to move, to tr trigger a motor neuron response. So you move the hand away from the fire or yeah. you don't move into walking on the sprained ankle anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the swelling is bringing the regenerative anabolic processes to the area, right? Exactly. Now, if we don't actually get a fix it, so say we've got some knee injury where there's real structural uh, damage in the knee or damage in the back, and so there is ongoing pain and inflammation, just that fact of permanent pain and inflammation from something like a structural issue can end up, I mean, most people think of it as demoralizing, right? And of course it can affect yeah. sleep quality, but that's actually going to produce cortisol cortisol, and in, inflammatory chemistry in the blood, some of which will cross blood brain barrier, have neuroinflammatory effects. And so as something as it seemingly prosaic as that, the actual physical therapy required, or maybe the PRP or surgery or whatever it is to mm -hmm. fix underlying structural issues can be one of the components. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, structure. We haven't really talked about that as a causal level um, issue. The tier one, <clears throat> our list of tier one things, we've included the toxins, the infections, the nutrients, the genetics, and structure. We talked about stress even, but structure is certainly one of those. And sometimes I think of genetics as the molecular structure, but structure from a chiropractor's point of view or a physical therapist's point of view is are you in alignment, right? Is, is the signaling going to be working? And if, you're, if your head's cracked, cock like this or your head is way forward to the rest of your body then are you ever going to get enough blood flow and nutrients all of these things that we've talked about are you ever going to get enough of them there and then the waste out of your head if that structure is off and this is one of the things that dr bredesen talks about in regards to cognitive um, function is vascular and and structural so and trauma can also be a component of this um but Vascular dementia is actually something I sort of celebrate, not because it's happening, but because we can do something about it, right? Like if we can get the structure in place, if we can get those arteries unclogged, we can get good blood flow both in and out of the brain, then we can make so much, move. we can get so much movement and so much healing to happen. So like we talked about um, the kind of major contribution of Walsh's work, you've mentioned Bredesen Protocol a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Just speak to what it is. So Dr. Bredesen has been working with um, Alzheimer's and his wife is an integrative functional medicine doc and he's a researcher and medical doctor um, and he's been studying Alzheimer's for decades. So he um, 
has put together a, a comprehensive approach to how to end Alzheimer's, how to stop cognitive decline. And it's certainly easier if we can start earlier on. But like I was telling you about my patient, Linda, she was she had a two out of 30 on her MOCA. So a perfect MOCA score is 30. This is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test that we use routinely on patients with any sort of cognitive decline. And she has the APOE genetics. So she's got genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's. She's got a strong family history. She's got all these toxins that I told you about. And she had advanced cognitive decline. Um, a two out of 30 is really, really heartbreaking. And she did not remember where she was, what day it was, you know, really simple things. She couldn't name a lion or a rhinoceros or a camel um, when she saw a picture of them. And so advanced cognitive decline, we can still do something about, which has been so helpful. Thank you, Dr. Redison, because he gave me the the confidence to even approach a patient like that and say, hey, there's something we can do. And sure enough, she came back four weeks later and she is doing so much better um, just by taking this Bredesen approach, which is comprehensive. So we're looking again at trauma, at toxins, at trophic factors. So is there enough of the hormones or the hormone balance? And this can be, we're looking for glycosylation and metabolic imbalances, um, and then we're also looking at the genetics. So the way Dr. Bredesen describes it, he says that there's 37 holes in the roof and we need to look at each of those systematically and plug those holes. And you made a great point. We've talked about this before, but as and like was the case with Linda, this I experienced this over the last couple of weeks with the patient. Once you start plugging some of those holes, they really start, the, the body's so incredible. It starts to heal itself. We give it a little bit of encouragement and then eight holes close up, right? And, and then nine holes and then 10 holes. And then it, it starts to, it's like a snowball effect in the right direction. Um, it's, it's really amazing and inspiring and humbling to see the body heal. So Dr. Bredesen's work is really neat because it's taking various things that have been known about in integrative and naturopathic and functional medicine applied to a very complex area of neurocognitive um, decline. And it is not only with Alzheimer's, but other neurodegenerative work that that kind of approach is um, helping and actually really formalizing it, getting doctors trained in it and being able to get a large body of data. Uh, we have some friends that are medical doctors that are actually working on doing the clinical studies of the Bredesen approach with um, Lee Rehood's organization, the Systems Biology Institute. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the things that's really tricky, and I, you know, for the listeners who are having this question come up, um, hey, why don't I see more um, published literature and clinical um, trials on these kinds of approaches? Is because since they are personalized approaches, it's very different than um, give everyone the same amount of a particular drug and mm -hmm. then you know look at in effect compared to a placebo on a large double blind randomized trial. If we're talking about something like copper zinc ratio, where it can actually be too high in either direction, and if you give someone the wrong thing, you make them worse rather than better, then testing to know what's going on and then creating personalized uh, treatment is actually the whole gist, right? It's not here's a pill for a um, symptomology presentation. It's here is a whole comprehensive personalized program for a personalized presentation. So what you have to test is the methodology of assessment, interpretation, treatment, and recursion. And that requires a different kind of science because nobody is getting the same protocol. It's very hard to placebo control that. It's hard to get a large clinical data trial, which is why it's a place like Systems Biology Institute that it's trying to do the science here. But we really are at the limits of what the way we have done scientific medical epistemology can do, which is if we're not just trying to do one synthetic drug as a treatment, but how do we actually respond to what clinical presentation looks like comprehensively at a cause level? It, it's a deeper kind of science. And with the systemic approach, yeah, it does not lend itself to the randomized placebo controlled trials uh, paradigm. And Dr. Bredesen, I think I shared his story with you when we've spoken in the past, but so he was working with a team in Australia to apply this. They were in the whole process of getting um, a trial through their IRB. And so he was talking to them and, and they were just about to finalize the protocol. And they said, Hey, you know, Dr. Bredesen, like we can't do this. There's just way too many variables. And he was like, all right, well, that's too bad. But they were like, like send us your protocol because we want to use it on our parents and our grandparents and everybody we know, we want them to use this. 
but because we get that it works, but we can't do the trial because it doesn't fit into our model. So people are saying that out loud. Um, and so we need systems biology, systems physiology, right? We need to put all of these pieces back together. This is not reductionist medicine. It's not reduc reductionist science. It, it, it's putting all these complex pieces back together. And it's, it is complex, yes, but there's a paradox in here. It, it's also very simple. It's, it's going back to those foundations of having a bowel movement every day, getting enough sleep, dancing and sweating and doing, getting exercise, laughing, spending time with the people you care most about. It, all of those things that are so foundational um, to good health are, are the foundations of Dr. Bredesen's work too, right? So we can measure all of these complex parameters. We can get really specific about it. There's a lot we can do, but it, I think it's also um, empowering to take a step back and say, hey, well, how do the, those foundations are so intricate, integral to that too? Yeah. Obviously very uh, advanced complex disease is different, but uh, people who just feel shitty, right? Subclinical depression, subclinical anhedonia. Uh, it's amazing how much better they feel oftentimes when they go camping with friends. Yeah. And obviously their genetics haven't changed. So if they have the idea that they have a genetic chemical imbalance, there might be chemistry that's imbalanced, but uh, it might be the kind of chemistry that comes from the combination of environmental exposure, not sleeping right. and stressing out all the time. I was going to say, or they might just be living in a moldy building, a moldy house, because that is the first thing I tell anybody who's considering um, testing for molds is one of the best things you can do, the least expensive test is to go spend a weekend in the desert in a tent. Mm -hmm. And if you feel better, mm -hmm. and then when you come back to your house, you feel worse, then it is very likely that there is an environmental um, component to that illness. So long as you isolate for a few of the things like, did you get away from family while you were gone and you have stressful family dynamics <laughs> or do you hate your job or other parts of your life that you need That's to a good focus point. on? That is a good point. Um, all of which is critical in looking at psychiatry. I mean, this is one of the key things is just like there are many people where they don't know there's mold in their house. There is, and they're just not going to get better no matter what the fuck you do mm -hmm. if you don't address their environment. And it might not be obvious. Um, most doctors aren't going to they might ask, are you sleeping well, right? Um, right? But do you have any kind of sense of meaning in your life? What do you dread? Uh, what is the nature of your relationships like? Um, when we look at how much of our neurochemistry, given that we we're tribal beings and our evolutionary biology is actually created in response to other humans, to pheromone exposure, to mm -hmm. eye contact, to... Um, it, you actually just can't do a good job of medicine, without looking at their environment, their diet, and their, how much, you know, if they're spending four hours a day on a Facebook feed, we have pretty clear stats that they're going to be depressed. Yep. There are kids playing video games. Yeah. So that psychology piece, you know, I, I can't do all of this alone, certainly. And I refer out quite a bit. So I refer out for neurofeedback and psychology. I'm actually working with a psychiatrist right now. We ha are creating a formal um, collaboration to help people get off of benzodiazepines. So people who are having trouble with sleep or anxiety, we're working together and he does, he does the med management, but he's also a psychologist. So he is helping with cognitive behavioral therapy and other psycho, um, psychotherapy. Um, he's got a, a blend of modalities that he uses kind of based on the patient presentation. And then I come in with the Walsh work, the nutrient balancing, and potentially the NAD plus. It's the most difficult part of getting off any medication is that first step and then that last step. So we often try to do the NAD plus IVs then to help people out. Um, and that, you know, when he and I were talking about formalizing this offering, um, we were trying to figure out how to keep the cost down, right? Like how do we make this accessible to as many people as possible? Because so many people are on benzodiazepines and benzodiazepines actually contribute to anxiety. They make it worse. It's kind of like a narcotic, like an opiate it, making the pain worse over time. Benzos actually make anxiety worse. They also contribute to dementia, um, especially when they're used long-term. They were never designed to be used long-term, but they get handed out a lot. And so we want to make this super accessible for people because we understand the risks. Um, and so we started talking about, okay, well, what can we cut out? Could we cut out the psychotherapy? And we just came to know we can't. You can't cut out the psychotherapy. Doing that hard, it's hard work, but um, but doing that work really taking that using a mirror and, and getting that self-reflection of how is my brain working? What are my my ingrained thought patterns? Am I being mindful? Um, 
and you know, even hypnosis. I mean, there's so many great, wonderful, the neurofeedback, there's so many great approaches to how do we change the way the brain is firing to go in a more positive, more collaborative, more creative direction. Um, but certainly psychotherapy is a, is a great uh, approach. So and one more thing about physiology that is, I would say one of the really common things that we see being able to help people quite quickly mm -hmm. is hormones. Oh yeah. And obviously hormones aren't going to be tier one. Usually there's something, you know, someone might've been exposed to a toxin that is a hormone disruptor, right? We see yeah. xenoestrogens and plastics or again, um, ubiquitous, but uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people are, used to thinking about hormones with menopause, people getting on HRT or men getting on TRT later. And of course the effects of that are profound for people who get on it. Um, women with endometriosis start to think about it, but not just sex hormones, right? Sex hormones, mm -hmm. adrenal hormones, thyroid hormones, neural hormones, um, being able to assess them and work with them. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm grateful. Anybody who has insurance, basically, we can get all of those labs run for almost little, almost no money. Um, so it's a no brainer to, to screen those. And um, that's also something I celebrate. If it's just a thyroid thing, it's just so, it's relatively uh, simple to, to fix that, to, to find some balance, especially if I'm working with a patient who's willing to do the work and change the diet and get the exercise and go to sleep a little bit earlier, man, that that's almost a, a, a it's good news. If you're depressed and you're gaining weight and your hair is falling out and, um, you can barely get out of bed in the morning, then if it's a thyroid problem, it's a relatively simple fix. So that's, that's good news in my book. Um, also if, you know, the, we were talking about, um, adrenal hormones that cortisol regulation and uh, norepi, you know, DHEA, there's a lot of things coming out of even salt water balance and blood pressure regulation and whether or not you have enough blood going to your brain. We talked about that from a structural perspective, but even from a blood pressure perspective, if you stand up and you can't get enough blood to your brain, then it's hard to have enough energy to go get through your day. Um, and the adrenals are responsible for, for all of those pieces. So looking at that, measuring that, again, those are secondary things like you mentioned. So I, I want people to feel better yesterday. And so we're going to support you in as, in as many ways as we can with replacement of those things. But I don't think of them as primary, as causal, and hopefully that that's temporary. My plan is always if that support is temporary, that I would like to help support your body to getting back to balance so that it creates in, enough of its own adrenal hormones, cortisol, epi, norepi, like all of these things need to be created by you, your thyroid, um, and ovaries or testicles, depending on your flavor. Um, and so my primary goal is getting you back to that place where your body creates that in its own balance. But if we need to, we certainly will supplement while, while you're on the path. And um, supplementing with aging is obviously kind of a, a philosophically deep and interesting topic, but, um, and it's been a medically deep topic where people have had questions about increase mm -hmm. of carcinogenesis or whatever, but which has actually been getting a lot clearer uh, that there is, there are safe ways to go. Yeah, it's a long conversation. I think that is really based on the individual. It's sort of like vaccines, right? It's what is your risk benefit ratio here? You know, a woman who had a hysterectomy in her 30s who has a family history of Alzheimer's and dementia and osteoporosis, it, the risk, and she has never had any breast cancer in her family um, or ovarian or uterine cancer has a very different risk ratio to somebody who's, you know, went through menopause at 55 and has lots and lots of breast cancer in her uh, family history. And maybe she's BRCA positive. You know, those are very, very different um, situations where the risk and, and potential benefit of replacing hormones is, um, is a totally different equation. Now, there are lots of things like herbs, and I have patients who have changed their diet and gotten more exercises and, and their hot flashes go away. But for the most part, I think that when I'm having a conversation about hormones, hormones are very protective. They're anabolic. They are associated with youth um, and, and, and good function. They're associated with the creation of healthy, happy cells wherever we are in the body, whether it's the brain or the skin or the gut. Um, and so... I think I, I probably lean on the side of, of being willing to work with people on hormones more often than not. 
Now you mentioned thyroid as being something that is uh, relatively easy. Obviously, if we're looking at autoimmunity of the thyroid, mm -hmm. it's a little harder than just imbalance in the thyroid. Yeah. But uh, how how likely is it that a person has had basic thyroid numbers run at a GP and said everything was fine, mm -hmm. and then come in and do a deeper thyroid panel and see that everything is not. Fine. Yeah, I, I get a mixed bag on that one. Um, but it's very, very, very common for someone to say, oh, they told me that my thyroid's normal. And usually what's happened is there's been one TSH, um, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. That's the hormone coming from your brain telling your thyroid how much thyroid hormone to make. And if all you do is a TSH, you have no idea about the thyroid hormone in the system. You have no idea if there's any autoimmune process. You have no idea if you're creating reverse T3 instead of T3. So I look at eight parameters on the thyroid and typically a conventional doc is going to look at one, maybe two. They might look at a T4. Um, and usually they're only looking at T4 if you're on levothyroxine or some synthetic um, synthroid, some synthetic thyroid replacement. So yeah, the answer to that is usually people are not getting a thorough workup for their thyroid. And it's super, it's so sad because I had somebody this week who told me that her conventional doc said, oh, it doesn't matter if you have Hashimoto's, there's nothing different that we're going to do. Well, hypothyroid disease is one thing and Hashimoto's is another. Hashimoto's can fluctuate between hyper and hypo and it's an immune system disorder. It's not a thyroid disorder. It's just that the, your immune system happens to be attacking your thyroid. And so the focus of our treatment, if we want to get to a cause level is going to be with the gut and with the immune system and reducing that inflammation and that cross reactivity um, from an immune perspective. So there's a lot of different, you know, the Karazian and Bothorp and Brownstein and um, Isabella Wentz is a new one. There's a lot of experts out there and there's a lot of books out there. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, they don't, they all disagree with each other, basically. And um, what I've found, my clinical experience is that they're all right some of the time for some people. And so figuring out which approach is going to be best for you takes a little bit of trial and error. So, you know, some of the experts say iodine is brilliant, give them lots and lots and lots. And other people say never, ever, ever iodine with Hashimoto's. And so um, making sure that the, the, the foundations are in order, that the immune system is, is well supported, the liver and adrenals are well supported, and then potentially adding some iodine, but probably not the 12.5 milligrams. It's not, that's not, not my style, not my preference. Although I see some people on it who do great, you know, it's, it's just a matter of um, determining what the right approach is for you. And I can understand the confusion out there around Hashimoto's because there's a lot of contention, a lot of um, disagreement in the, even among the experts in that community. It's such a fun area of medicine to get to work. It is. To, I love it. To, uh, you know, help someone with, with heart disease is obviously beautiful. To help them with cancer is beautiful. Um, you can, no matter what it is, helping people get out of suffering or avoid it is great. But psychological suffering has such a unique um, type of painful characteristic to it. And having someone be able to get out of anxiety or out of depression um, or be able to look towards old age without looking towards Alzheimer's and, you know, loss of their awareness of self. Um, yeah, it's, it happens to be one of the most complex areas because it requires looking at the whole physiology and the nervous system happens to be the hardest thing for us to do diagnosis in. And again, it's most complex. Um, but it also happens to be a place where the changes in function are just so profound to the changes in quality of life. So I couldn't ask for a better job. And that is my very favorite part of it is getting to see people return to their life in more balance and share their gifts with the world. And, you know, we were talking about mass shootings and that's just one of the many, many, many problems that the earth and our human population is facing. And that is my why. Um, that is why I practice this medicine is because we need people showing up who can offer their gifts to the world, who can offer those solutions. And when you don't feel good, when you are suffering with anxiety and depression and insomnia, and well, actually insomnia might help, but <laughs> if you don't sleep, you have a lot more time to solve the world's problems. But uh, if you aren't feeling good, it is, it's really difficult to share your gifts with the world. And, and we want people who can show up and do that. So for, Listeners that are interested to take this further, I just want to share um, 
on almost all the topics. If you're interested in um, the mold, there's a whole universe you can study. You can go to Dr. Shoemaker's site. You can look at the moldy documentary Dave Asprey put together. You can just, I mean, Google will take you to a lot of places. If you are interested in um, Dr. Walsh's stuff, you can go there, Dr. Bredesen's stuff. Um, so there's a lot of area to study. I again want to say, um, don't start trying to put a medical program together for yourself based on anything that you heard here. Don't try and change your meds or et cetera. Do educate yourself. And then if with your education, you decide that you want to, uh, you know, get support, get diagnostics, go deeper. Um, one of the things that we're working on here at Neurohacker Collective is uh, finding all the docs that we can that have really good training and in integrative neuropsych work um, so that when we tell people, hey, this isn't uh, medical advice, go talk to your doctor, we can actually have doctors that we can recommend people to. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, if you go look, if you look up functional medicine doctors, integrative doctors, naturopaths in your area, see if they do the, any of the methods that we've talked about here, see what their Yelp reviews are, talk to them, that's a good step. If you happen to be in the Southern California area and you want to, um, one, one of the common problems as people start to get into deeper integrative medicine is they find something that actually works more than never in an area where nothing worked previously. And they get so excited about that 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 becomes kind of the, uh, the favorite pet treatment. So everyone has adrenal stress or everyone has thyroid disorder or everyone has a gut-brain axis disorder. And... Um, and while it might be true that almost everyone has something going on there because it's an interconnected system, being able to really look at the whole thing and know how to prioritize those and work with those together is just a radically different thing. And uh, there are unfortunately not that many medical facilities that are doing a decent job of it yet. There are fortunately some starting to work at it. And so uh, uh, web, your website is northcountynaturalmedicine.com. That's correct. Yeah. NorthCountyNaturalMedicine.com or hello at North County Natural Medicine will get you an email to my friend desk. 760-385-8663. We'll also get you a girl on the phone. Very sweet. Melanie, Jamie, Leilani. Yay. So if uh, people are interested and want to, you know, go actually pursue some diagnostics, see what's going on, whether it's to address some real symptomology or whether it's to address prevention or optimization, you know, it, a lot of people don't experience having cognitive decline, but it doesn't mean that they're at their cognitive optimum either or their psychological optimum and the degree of, uh, you know, brightness is higher. And, that's and also, also if fun. there's a family history, so if there's a family history of mental health disorders, if there's a family history of Alzheimer's or dementia, I would love to see you sooner rather than later and prevent the suffering. Well, Heather, thank you for coming and for joining. This was fun as thank always. You. Thank you and, so much for having me. And uh, I look forward to our next conversation, other topics of uh, complex medicine. And continued collaboration. I'm so grateful for Qualia. It's helped a ton of my patients as well. So thank you for what you guys are doing. All right. Bye, y'all. Good night. Thank you for listening to Collective Insights. For the full show notes on this episode and for more great interviews, visit us at neurohacker.com slash collective insights. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Want to learn a better strategy for mental well-being? We designed a beautifully illustrated 32-page guide integrating care for your mind, brain, body, and environment into a balanced approach for a better life. Download the Foundational Guide to Neurohacking at neurohacker.com backslash guide.